First of all, welcome. It's been about a year, but we're happy to present some updates on the Matagorda Bay Ecosystem Assessment. Um, Greg, if you'd hit the next slide. Okay. So just while folks are getting settled in, we'll cover some, some tips when it comes to using WebEx. Hopefully everybody is settled down in front of their computer. That's really the best tool for the job. Um, but if your internet connection gets flaky, or if you'd like to get up and get around, you can always switch your audio connection to your phone. Um, you can find that under the audio and visual settings um, and hit that call in option. Next slide, please. So as everyone may have noticed, um, you're coming in and you're automatically muted. We've got a lot of presentations today and quite a few folks tuning in. Um, so while everybody's talking, we'll go ahead and keep everyone on mute as much as possible. Now, we have some time dedicated at the end for question and answer. So if there's any sort of comment or question, we'll kind of cover sort of the housekeeping when we get to that point. Now, if you're having technical difficulties, my colleague Lauren Borland has very graciously offered to sort of help field any of your questions. You can contact us using the chat feature in WebEx. If your screen doesn't quite look like this one, if you hit, hit that speech bubble kind of in that bottom right hand corner, that should open up your chat box. You can type any message you'd like. You can send it to everyone. You can find Lauren. Um, but go ahead and hit enter after you kind of write your comment and that way it'll actually get sent. All right, two minutes passed. Let's hit the next slide. All right, well, let's see, we're online tonight. So if anyone kind of logs in late, this meeting is being recorded so you can catch the first few moments. But of course, I wanted to welcome everyone again to the webinar. This is our annual update for the Matagorda Bay Ecosystem Assessment. There's a lot of material to cover tonight. We hope to you know, get some good questions at the end and save plenty of time for that. So before we get things rolling, I just wanted to you know, kind of give the first few words to Associate Deputy Comptroller Robert Wood. Next Thank you. Time. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, everybody. Um, again, I'm Robert Wood. I'm Associate Deputy Controller, and and some of y'all were on the call early, but some most weren't. Uh, you know, I mentioned I'm over a number of divisions at the agency. Um, the Natural Resources Program is just fun and different for me because it's it's different than the numbers and the sort of the the things that that the controller's office is known for. And so, I'm looking forward to tonight, and and want to thank you for joining us. We're enthusiastic to update you on the progress that's been made over the past year by our research team. Before we get going, I wanna make sure that we acknowledge everyone that's volunteered their time and expertise to support this project. One of the first things you'll notice tonight is how many people have been involved in making the project a success. Local residents have volunteered to join water quality sampling efforts. They took, they took researchers out on their boats, participated in sample collection. Fishermen have helped guide the search for sea turtles, providing researchers with tips on where those turtles have been seen around the bay. Other agencies, organizations, Parks and Wildlife, um, others have provided content for the story maps and have hosted meetings to expand public awareness on the project. The local insight and participation has been incredibly valuable, thank you. It improves the quality and the effectiveness of the work and the efficiency. It also helps ensure that the research that we produce and the maps and the tools and everything that we're working on is useful and practical for the community. And I think that's something that, that we, we really feel strongly about is that we come up with something that's, that's good for the people who live in that region. As you all know, Matagor is an important part of the state. The Bay provides resources that support economic activities such as commercial and residential fish and recreational fishing, commercial oystering, agriculture and tourism, and it's home to a number of endangered species and threatened species. So the project's a priority for our group, for our natural resources group, and they, they have focused on ex expanding our understanding of the region. The intent of this work is to provide the science and the tools that the local decision makers can use in their land management and conservation decisions. 
Matagorda region, like so much of our state, is undergoing just a tremendous amount of change. And so while we're all grappling with the, the new normal um, and all of the unknowns, Bay remains a bright spot. So it's a place to fish, to relax. It's a place to make a living. We're looking forward to continuing to support the research that expands our understanding of the ecosystem and supports the long-term economic growth and the lands management decisions <laughs> that are being driven at the local level. So thanks you, thank you again for tuning in tonight. Thanks for having me. I know the researchers have got a lot of good information to share, so I'm going to give it back to Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks, Robert. Um, Greg, if you'll go ahead and jump ahead a slide or two. Okay. And give me, that's, that's it. So, yeah, thanks, Robert. We appreciate you kind of chiming in here at the beginning. Um, my name is Chelsea Jones. I'm a senior research analyst with the Natural Resources Program here at the Comptroller's Office. My colleague, Lauren Borland, who is on the chat, in case you have any issues, um, she and I work directly with the assessment team. Um, you know, of course, they have a lot of information to cover, and I'm going to try to save all the details for them. But I always like to take an opportunity to introduce my program, you know, kind of give an overview of what we're doing, as well as, you know, give a sense of our role in this work. So, you know, the Natural Resources Program is sort of a special group at the state's tax agency. But we get to collaborate with, you know, any number of stakeholders, and we we define this very broadly. So state agencies, federal agencies like the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as just organizations and individuals. You know, we're, we're interested in working with groups and helping them fill information gaps for, you know, sort of science-based solutions to conservation challenges. Now, a lot of different groups across the state are kind of working in the same area, but our, our niche, sort of our specialty, is working with groups that have information gaps for some of these challenges that have to balance conservation activity with economic activity. So in order to sort of fulfill our program mission, we receive and distribute funding from the Texas legislature, and we, we distribute it to Texas public universities in the form of research contracts. And these, these are a little more hands-on. You know, that's kind of an example of why we're having this meeting today. But in this case, we're funding Texas A&M University Corpus Christi and their partners here today to fill some information gaps about the Bay. Now, as a program, we sort of occupy this funny intersection of science and policy. We're working with the researchers on one hand to kind of, you know, see what needs need to be addressed and how, you know, different research tools can work towards that. But we're also trying to get this information over to the decision makers and the folks who will use it. Now, this map here kind of shows where my program has worked across the state. And a lot of these are examples of species that have been involved with the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, so, you know, an example of sort of the product of sitting at this intersection and facilitating this exchange is you know, certain stakeholders can achieve regulatory certainty with the federal law, or folks can just improve long-term conservation strategies. So, so, next slide. What are a few examples of these information gaps? I kind of mention it again and again, and, you know, what we're trying to achieve through a lot of this research. Well, we're typically talking to partners about rare or really hard to study species. The Kemp's Ridley sea turtle kind of shown here is a really good example of that. You know, it's a turtle that I think has a lot of folks' attention. It is critically endangered under the Endangered Species Act. But, you know, when it comes to studying it, it's kind of a conundrum. You have nesting females that will lug themselves up onto the beach, lay eggs, and if you're lucky, you know, a few months later, hatchlings will make the sprint back to the water. Well, where does that leave everything else? What about the males? What about the females that aren't coming to the beach this year? And what happens to the juveniles or the hatchlings as soon as they hit the water? So really we're kind of talking to partners, talking to resource, researchers and pulling out what kind of data or trends we can prioritize as information gaps. What do we need to understand the species a little better? 
and by virtue, have a better sense of what it takes to conserve it. So, you know, typically that leads us with like really fundamental questions. Any species, what is it? Where does it live? How many are there? And what does it eat? And that kind of is, is good background when we're talking about the assessment. So if you go to the next slide. You know, when we first came to this region, we wanted to follow a similar process. You know, talk to the folks that are involved, figure out what they need to know. Um, but there were a few things that sort of took us back right away. You know, for one, Matagorda has hundreds of species. I mean, hundreds of birds alone. And quite a few of them are sort of at that intersection of endangered species issues or migratory bird issues and so forth. We also found that there's a bunch of different organizations, be it state agencies or groups or individuals, who are really sort of invested in the Bay's future. And this is, you know, this is for multiple different reasons, be it economic or ecologic. And something that stood out was folks aren't really, you know, you even meet species oriented groups, but so often, even among these groups, they're always referring to the Bay. They're always talking about the system and something bigger than a single species issue. So next slide, please. In 2016, we partnered, or no, 2019, just gosh, last summer, we got to partner with Texas A&M Corpus Christi and start to explore the Bay as a system. And it was a really cool transition from, you know, what my program had been pursuing as single species projects, kind of tunnel vision. What do I need to know about this one thing? To understanding the system in the context of like just coastal dynamics. So the researchers today will kind of cover these research goals in quite a bit more detail. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really dwell on that for too long. Um, but if you'll go to the next slide, I think I can sum it up briefly as kind of keying into this common denominator that is habitats. So moving from a singular focus on a species to understanding how that species is using a habitat and how that's available to it throughout this ecosystem. So, you know, seagrass beds, they're found in different spots of Matagorda Bay. They cater to different sea turtles, you know, in different ways, um, but they're also important fish nursery. and you know, their health is gonna have a big impact on the rest of the system. The same can be said for countless other habitats in this region. Another picture we have here are salt marshes. And salt marshes, of course, can be significant habitat for coastal birds, but they can also, you know, kind of deal with coastal change and flooding and erosion, and they contribute significantly to the bay's food web. So, you know, that's kind of how I'd like to frame it moving forward. Again, saving the details for the researchers, but quickly to kind of cover how my program's role is shifting now that the research has gained momentum. Of course, when we first started, we were talking to lots of groups, kind of figuring out what these needs were. Now that the research is really humming along, we wanna to shift to an information sharing. Now with COVID, that's gotta be online, not as in-person as much as we'd like, you know, take today for an example. But, you know, we're really excited to use a new tool called Story Map. Next slide, please. So Story Maps, I mean, they're they're like a trademark name for a web page, right? It's it's a web page that is neatly packaged around one specific theme. And we're, you know, looking forward to taking what is a really complex project and breaking it down <laughs> and taking one habitat at a time to kind of key into different concepts and the ecological and economic significance of this work. So, you know, take chapter two, which was sort of our first focus on open water habitats. And we're here to talk about key concepts, research updates, and then where we can kind of highlight some regional economic trends. Now, none of these are supposed to be the encyclopedia for, for these habitats that already exists, you know, folks work on that. But, you know, instead, we're really excited to just contextualize this work. 
and produce it every three months or so that so that folks can stay engaged and kind of keep it on their radar as we chug along. Um, of course, these two chapters are available online. This map you see here, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Jim's team has already produced an interactive web map. So if you log on to chapter one, you can start to explore all these different layers and kind of check them out for yourself. Um, these are sort of adaptable. I mean, extremely adaptable, right? In a few weeks, we hope to produce chapter three to cover oyster reefs. But if you check them out, if you share them with some folks and you have any feedback, you know, please let us know. You know, we can, we can incorporate your changes. We can add new information. It's really, we wanna make this product better for the folks using it. And it's just one of many, right? So <laughs> other ways to stay involved, we have websites, we have social media. The research team can really highlight that today, as well as a few examples of the folks they actually got to work with hands-on um, before the pandemic. So, you know, we really appreciate your involvement. Of course, tuning in today's meeting is a great example. Um, but with that, I think I'll say thanks for tuning in and I'll hand it off to Greg. All right, well, thank you, Chelsea. And I really appreciate everyone uh, coming out or at least tuning in and uh, listening to the updates that we have going on for the Matagorda Bay project. I think both Chelsea and Mr. Wood did a great job introducing the project and the significance and what it means to the state of Texas and really beyond in the Gulf of Mexico. And so to reiterate what we had briefly just discussed is that typically we focus the scientists on single species, but recently, or probably in the past decade or so, this ecosystem management has really caught on where we've recognized that to really protect and conserve species and habitats and all the things that we love, like Matagorda Bay, for example, uh, you really need to understand the ecosystem as a whole. And I don't think the field of science really disagrees with that at all. In fact, it's very supportive, but the issue there, it's very challenging because when we go to manage an ecosystem, the first thing that you discover pretty quickly is we may not have everything we need to know about the ecosystem to manage it properly. And that's really where this project stepped in. We had the resources and the team to really do one of the first uh, ecosystem assessments of a base system. And you really couldn't have picked a better bay or a location than Matagorda Bay, given it, it's all unique characteristics and the, the vast diversity and abundance of marine life and birds and turtles and all kinds of things that are using that estuary. So this is really a large team that I'll introduce in a minute. I'm only gonna talk for a few minutes. And by the way, I should have introduced myself better. I'm Greg Stuns. I'm the endowed chair for fisheries and ocean health at the Heart Research Institute that's located at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And I'll introduce my other team members uh, one by one, but they're really experts in the field and around the region and really have a, a high understanding of the interactions that occur in estuaries. But our overall goal, and some of you hopefully had, were there at our first stakeholder meeting, and I don't wanna repeat that meeting, and it's captured very well in these great story maps that Chelsea and her team have put together. But I wanted to make sure we're at least kind of on the same page of what are we really doing here and what are we talking about? And then it'll make a little more sense as you hear updates from the investigators. Then of course, we plan to continue this engagement uh, throughout the course of this project. And so we're kind of midstream in the project here, and. We're happy today to report kind of where were we, where are we today, and where are we headed in the future as we begin to wrap up this project in a year or so. And so what this ecosystem approach does and what was mentioned is it really leads to ecosystem-based management where we care about endangered species certainly and sea turtles, but if you're managing the ecosystem as a whole, those species kind of take care of themselves if you have proper management at that ecosystem level. But also what this does is it informs uh, what are areas we wanna protect, what are areas we wanna conserve and restore um, for future sea turtles and also the uh, large uh, bird component that we have with this project. And as we all know too, we live in a climate that changes very rapidly from storms and hurricanes and a whole variety of other natural events. Projects like this help us prioritize those areas to mitigate those events and also provide sort of a, a really multidisciplinary approach to how can we look to the future so we preserve what we have here in Matagorda Bay. So to give you an idea of the scope of the project, and I'll also end with this slide as well, and as Chelsea mentioned, there's a great interactive version of this 
online. Uh, this is the scope of the project within the yellow lines that you see there is a large mapping component that we'll hear about from Doc, Dr. Jabot in a minute. That's really the first step. If you don't have great base maps and know where you are today, and even Jim can look into the past of what these looked like in the past and then make projections in the future, uh, that really limits us. So mapping is a very big component, but also Ed O'Borney comes in with mapping uh, sub tidal areas, things under the water, like oyster reefs and seagrasses and marshes and things where Jim and, and Ed overlap a little bit. But one of the key aspects of this project will be having really refined, detailed maps of the past, the present, and what we might, the future might hold as, as uh, things may or may not change. So to introduce our team, and each one will talk about where they're at today, of course, the sea turtles is what's driving this. And, Dr. Plotkin and her team are leading, leading that. Um, Dr. Natalie Wilderman today is gonna to be talking about the sea turtles and the work that they're doing. We've set up large animal tracking networks as well as sophisticated satellite tracks to, to track those um, species. But of course, as I mentioned, uh, it all starts out with the mapping and Ed O'Borney and Jim Jabot will talk a few minutes each about where they are with the mapping. Then we have a biological team that really begins to understand what do the communities look like? Because we know as scientists to have resilient ecosystems and healthy and abundant and robust endangered species populations, you have to have healthy communities, but we often don't have an understanding of what those communities look like. And those components, um, my research team is somewhat involved in that, but it's really led by Dr. Rooker and Dr. Pollock, and they'll talk more about the community assessments that we have going on. Certainly in this day and age, we're all concerned about water quality and what does water quality mean to um, the ecosystem and also things like harmful algal blooms and a whole variety of other events that happen as a result of water quality. And Dr. Mike Wetz is a real expert there and he's gonna talk about the water quality in Matagorda Bay and the work that he has going on, but also a really piece of this program and project that we're proud of. And that's a large citizen science component that that he's been able to develop and pattern after some other areas where he's been working and involves everyday citizens to help us collect data. And you'll, you'll see that theme occurring as well through other components such as the birds and um, the sea turtles and other things. A, a real uh, area we're focusing on in science and our team is real proud of that is that everyday people can get involved in collecting the science and have a more meaningful experience of how they enjoy the bay system. And at the same time provide us with real data that we can use to help in this assessment. So the other component is maybe a little more detailed, but very, very important. And that is how does the ecosystem function? And we study how ecosystems function through food webs. And it's really what fuels this ecosystem, what drives it, what allows it to be Matagorda Bay. And we study that through food webs. And so Dr. Wells is here to talk about um, a lot of the food web components he's working on, he really works in the upper part of the food web. And he'll explain that a little bit later, but also Dr. Pollock, who's not only an oyster expert involved with the community analyses, she's also a food web, food web expert. And they'll talk about the ways they understand and look at food webs. And then finally, uh, Ed O'Borney is leading uh, the bird component of this project. And I'll let him explain a little more in terms of uh, understanding uh, macrofaunal densities in particular, but in addition to turtles, birds identifying their food bases, trends over time, habitats, looking at marshes, obviously they're here in, to a large extent because of the marshes and other habitats. And looking at general, those ecological hotspots that are occurring um, throughout Matagorda Bay and Ed's leading a major component of, of that. So really how all this comes together and why we feel these story maps are really important is that integrating all these di these disciplines is, is difficult. And so um, we spend a lot of time uh, integrating these and, and trying to look at the data that's coming in in terms of what's the state of the key habitats that we have, how are they changing through time? That's really where our mapping components and how might they change in the future and how can we inform managers so they have the most robust data to make the most informed decisions about how we protect this environment and have an adaptive approach to uh, uh, conserving and protecting Matagorda Bay as we know it. And so that's really what's driving the project. And so I'll start here with our mapping component and Dr. Jabot in a minute. 
and then he'll go through each. Uh, we'll go through each section of of the uh, scientists and their various components very briefly at a high level, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for any questions that anyone might have. So I'll start with Dr. Jabot. Jim, if if you're ready to talk about um, your mapping piece, uh, go ahead and I'll forward the slides for you. Hi, uh, thanks, Greg, and good evening, everybody. And uh, as Greg mentioned, we're working hard on developing a map of the current uh, environment for that larger um, yellow outline that he showed on his map. Uh, we're concentrating on the intertidal to the upland areas um, to, to map the uh, current distributions of geo, geo environments or habitats. And our primary source for this mapping is Worldview 2 multispectral satellite imagery. And uh, we were very fortunate to um, be able to acquire uh, these this imagery uh, be, because it is um, a private um, source. And Worldview 2 has a two meter resolution and it has eight spectral bands, which makes it a very um, a unique um, satellite and um, very capable. And we've pre-processed all the imagery for that uh, broader field area. Uh, and um, we we needed to remove the effects of the atmosphere and to better geo-reference it a, as well. So we've done all that. And we're working on classifying it now. And our primary approach to classifying the satellite data into land cover, or, you know, our habitats or geo environments is the um, training of a deep convolutional neural network. So the neural network is a supervised feature learning approach, uh, and more, um, more akin to object based um, classification than say pixel based classification uh, routines if if that um, helps you at all and um, the slide here shows uh, a, a test area we have of the Colorado River Delta and a few um, classes there uh, that we're evaluating and we uh, continue to go through an iterative process and we need to build a training site database, and that's what we've been doing a, a lot of, uh, using uh, sites that we know what's there, and then telling the algorithm that we know where these are, tell us where other places similar to it are, so that we can segment this map and come up with our, with our uh, different classes of habitats or land cover. And so uh, to do that, to come up with the training sites, uh, so far we've been using vertical aerial photography, uh, very detailed uh, photography, but also low altitude oblique aerial photography that we have from uh, pictometry, uh, which is uh, really great to be able to interpret from afar uh, what the uh, environment is there and develop your training site base. We also will be using all the information that the rest of the team has been collecting on the ground though. Next, Greg. And um, in addition to the imagery, um, we need very good topography so that we can look at where the vulnerable areas are but also so that we can input it into the classification routine along with the imagery, because uh, topography, especially when you're in the intertidal or the low upland regions, is incredibly important to what you get, what kind of habitat you have. And so uh, we think that the um, elevation data is very important to include in the classification process. And, um, uh, we also um, need to know the bare earth elevation. Uh, many of you know that this is an image of two um, LIDAR models. The one on the left is bare earth and the one on the right is all points. And uh, we can use both of those. They both provide information. The one on the right provides more information on the canopy, the vegetation. The one on the left is what we need to look at the geomorphology and uh, the vulnerability of, of certain habitats to flooding. Um, so we're very fortunate 
uh, for this project to have available to us uh, 2018 and 2019 LIDAR surveys covering the entire area uh, all around the bay, the larger bay. And uh, we also have uh, more LIDAR data along uh, Managorda Peninsula. Uh, we have a time series actually uh, so that we can look at changes there along uh, Managorda Peninsula. So uh, those are two things. Uh, that's the, uh, the imagery and the uh, digital elevation model are, are really important data sources that we've been working on to build this current map of the, the situation. Next, please. And this is my last slide. Uh, we've also uh, have been looking at how key areas have changed in the past under ongoing processes and after key events such as uh, river flows or hurricanes. And we have manually digitized a time series of vertical aerial photographs, georeferencing them when needed so we can track how the system has evolved through time. And here in this slide is an example from the west side of the Colorado River Delta. And you can see the results of the manipulation of the Delta through time starting in uh, 1943. And um, it, it's, it's a very interesting uh, history here. I won't go through it. That I take far too much time than what I have. Um, but we will continue uh, this kind of mapping in the, in the, more, in the lower part of the uh, field area, this uh, Colorado River Delta area and all out the Managorda Peninsula. And uh, it will, um, will help us understand how things have changed and how things may have, have been different in the past and then how things uh, could potentially evolve in the future. So we'll continue our mapping work and we'll be spatially integrating uh, other data information being developed in the project. And uh, by the way, all the mapping and geodatabases will be publicly available um, at the end. So that's what I have for now, Greg. All right, thanks, Dr. Javot. Well, up next, uh, we have Ed O'Borney to talk about some of the mapping as it relates to uh, uh, sub bottom features or subtitle features, as well as some of the bird and vegetation work that he has going on. So, Ed, are you ready? I'm ready. Thanks, Greg. All right, go ahead. So, I've got about six hours worth of presentation that, uh, Myron, you'll be happy to know that Greg and Quentin told me I've got less than seven minutes. So, I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to go through this quickly. If there's questions at the end, feel free to let us know. I was also happy to see Dr. Dubow. Some of his maps went back to the 40s because it, those 90s, I, I cut my teeth on my first projects in Matagorda Bay post diversion in early 90s and spent a lot of time pulling otter trawls. Uh, and to look at that delta and the changes, even from the 90s, is, is really cool. So, anyway, minute gone, five to go. Uh, we're doing the benthic habitat mapping in the coastal bird and marsh work. Uh, the area you see on your screen is about 56,000 acres of open bay uh, with oyster reef and so forth. So what we did, we, we talked about this before, you hop in a boat, Port O'Connor, you, you, you go one way, about five hours, you turn around, you come five hours back and you shoot your side scan, you shoot in your bathymetry and call it a day. Uh, some of those large tracks in the middle. And this is just a map of the side scan imagery, looking at bottom hardness. Uh, we're not gonna focus here, but if you, if you glance off to the right, you'll pick up some oyster reefs that, that are very familiar. I'm sure, Bill, you know many of these well. Uh, and so, next slide, Greg. The next part is to pick up bathymetry, where Dr. Jabot was talking about the importance of elevation. So we've got the uh, topography in the bay or the bathymetry in the bay as well. You can see the ship channel there, you know, up to almost 80 feet deep down to very shallow around the edges of the barrier island. Uh, so we've got that detailed imagery in this 56,000 acre uh, open area as well. Next slide. And so how do you how do you interpret some of this information? And we don't we can't do a class today in, in the couple minutes left, but we basically had four categories of looking at the substrate to see if it was oyster reef or potential oyster reef. Just because it's hard substrate doesn't mean it's not a shipwreck or a a, a treasure chest of gold or a pipeline or something like that. 
But you can start training this imagery to pick up stuff. And so our category one is living oyster reef. And you'll see that there's a, a modified oyster dredge on the bottom. And that's what you get when you pull it through a living oyster reef, you get live oysters. Uh, second is viable oyster habitat. This is where you pull and you get solid uh, substrate, but you'll primarily just get shell, oyster shells. Uh, third is interspersed firm mud and sand. Looks pretty good on the imagery, but you'll know it when you pull that up. Also hard to pull up uh, uh, some of that. And then everybody, after you've been on day on the bay, your favorite one is open bay bottom when you pull up a, a 40 pound dredge that's only 40 pounds. So that's kind of nice. Uh, anyway, so this is how we do our imagery, the classification. Next slide. And it, what, what it leads to is you have large areas of potential reef, viable reef, uh, or interspersed mud. I didn't mark all the open bay. And then what you do is, of course, you could be wrong with some of the imagery classification. So we went back out and did verification sampling, spent a week looking for oysters, a week looking at seagrasses, and set up a statistical design to, to check those out. And so this map, we can't focus here, but there's there's a lot of reef up there and the, closer to the Delta. And as you get further away in this open area, there's some very potential habitat for restoration uh, opportunities, but you don't have large reefs uh, in, in the open part of this uh, Matagorda Bay system. Next slide. And then seagrasses, same thing. We'll map the seagrasses. They don't pick up nearly as well on the side scan, but with, with other imagery, you can pick those up as well. We did a week's worth of out, uh, verification sampling in early uh, August of this year. And it, it, as those of you who know the Bay, you know that the seagrass map is, it's what was there in the summer of 2020. And it's gonna change next year. It's gonna move up or down a little bit but it stays fairly consistent in the certain areas. So we've got the map, but we also look at coverage where it's very thick or it's not. And the fishermen that are on the call, they, they know all these areas already, uh, as well as the reefs. Next slide. And this is my final slide. Uh, just gonna touch briefly uh, on the bird surveys and marsh vegetation. I don't have time to go into the details, but there's some really cool stuff out there. We've been collecting samples while we're out and passing them on to Dr. Pollock in her lab of live oysters and seagrasses, seagrass plugs and marsh vegetation. And so we just completed our fall vegetation surveys as well as our fall bird surveys. We picked up a couple of hooping cranes at Mad Island Marsh, which I thought was, was really cool, uh, as long as, along with oyster catchers and other stuff, Bill. But uh, a lot of cool birds out there, beautiful time of year to be out on the bay. And with that, I will pass it on back to you, Greg, or on to uh, Dr. Paul. All right, thanks for that update, Ed. And so our next uh, up is Dr. Pollock, who's heading up a variety of components of this project. And so Dr. Pollock, whenever you're ready. Sure, thanks, Greg. And the order here is very good because I'm gonna spend a little bit of time uh, going back over some of the efforts, so some of the samples that have resulted from Ed's team's efforts. So Ed's being a little bit humble, but his team has been putting just countless weeks on the water and we've been able to benefit from a lot of their efforts in terms of getting samples over a much wider range of the bay than we ever could have anticipated getting on our own. So I wanted to just highlight that in these first couple of maps. So uh, this first map here just shows, um, I guess it's a different view of where oyster, potential oyster reefs had been identified by Ed's team throughout the bay. And then if you go to the next one, Greg. So then this green, again, is another way of visualizing sites where they ground truth their seagrass um, side scan work. So those you can see that are, um, most of these are down towards the uh, Port O'Connor and the inlet. And then next, next map. These are locations where my team has gone out then and took complementary samples of bay bottom to look at benthic microalgae as an important contributor to organic matter production in the bay. And then next map. And then this just shows everything overlaid to just give you an idea of really the breadth of samples that we are 
um, able to work with across the project site, which I think is just really incredible uh, at this point in the study. Okay, Greg. Okay, I want to just talk through the three kind of major studies that my group has been undertaking. The first one here is really focused on oyster reefs and understanding the community composition between unharvested reefs, which are located uh, mostly on the backside of the peninsula, and then harvested reefs, which are located out in the eastern arm of Matagorda Bay proper. So if you go ahead and click again. So what we're looking at here, let me just orient you really quickly. This is just sort of a summary figure from our samples from January of 2020. What we're looking at here is the stable isotope signatures of the primary producers. So you can think of those as the vegetation or the plants within the Matagorda Bay system, and then the consumers. So we can have primary consumers that are eating the plants, and then we can have secondary consumers that are eating those herbivores, if you will. And if you look along that axis on the bottom, the x-axis, as you move from left to right, that separation helps identify different primary producers. And as you move up and down the, the delta N15 axis uh, or the y-axis, you can see that there's a separation of organisms where the lower values indicate primary producers, those green um, symbols on the, on the biplot here. And then as you move up in higher values, you're moving into higher trophic levels. So again, you can kind of think along the x-axis as separating different primary food resources. And then as you move up the graph, you're looking at higher trophic levels. And go ahead and click again, Greg. And one more time, please. And so what I'm highlighting here with the, the shaded green box here is just the all of the primary um, producer data that we've collected so far. And then I've shaded in red here, essentially all of our consumer data. And like Greg said at the beginning of the talk, um, Dr. Wells is gonna be talking about much higher up in the food web than we're working on. We're working on little critters that are living in and among the oyster reefs. So we're mostly looking at things like gastropod snails and very small crabs and maybe some benthic fishes, as well as the oysters that are living on the reef. So none of the really big or larger sized um, sport fish or things like that that are important in the system. We're looking more at sort of the prey for these larger organisms and the turtles. And what I want to draw your attention to here is we've colored these symbols so that the um, sites one and two are unharvested reefs, and those are all open. They all have an open symbol. And Mad Island um, and Shell, those are closed symbols, and those represent our harvested reefs. And what you can see right away is that the closed symbols and the open symbols are all really grouping together. And so we don't really see differences in terms of the food resources that are available for consumers on the unharvested reefs or the harvested reefs. And the same thing with the consumers. So it seems like at least in terms of the food webs, there are not substantial differences when we look at it this way between those harvested and unharvested reefs. And then if you can click again, please, Greg. So we're seeing that this trophic structure, like I said, is similar between reef types. And so our next step moving forward, so this was just a snapshot of one month of data but our next step is going to be to add in other months of data and also to add biomass because we're interested to see if the sizes of the organisms um, proportionally changes between those unharvested and harvested reefs. And maybe we can develop some metrics that can help us better tease apart the differences between these different habitats. If you look at the those little pictures on the left between the unharvested reefs and the harvested reefs, you can see that the um, three-dimensional complexity is quite different as well as the size of the oysters. And so um, we certainly are expecting to see some differences within those communities that are utilizing these, um, these different habitats as well as the food resources that are available, but we're still kind of teasing that apart right now. But that's some of our preliminary data for the reef food webs. And then next slide, please. Okay. This is returning to that big map that shows um, a lot of the samples that were collected by BioWest as well as our group in the middle of the bay. Again, just to orient you, we have the seagrass beds in the green, benthic habitat samples in the white, uh, water samples were also taken across the bay, and then we have the oyster reefs in red. And the second chapter, the second study that we have undertaken in the bay that we're sort of in the midst of, of working on right now, is to try to understand what is the fuel for the Matagorda Bay food web. So what are the, what of which primary producer groups, the base of the food web is contributing and in what ways um, 
to the food web of Matagorda Bay. And so our goal here is to understand the quality and quantity of organic matter produced by these different primary producers. So the seagrasses, the benthic microalgae, the water um, phytoplankton in the water column, et cetera. And then we're using oysters that were shown here in red as recorders. So oysters are suspension feeders. And so they're primary consumers. They're feeding on that plant material. And we're using those oysters to understand the assimilation of that organic matter into the food web because oysters are the first ones to feed on that lower trophic level, but then they're food for larger organisms. So we can look at them as sort of a linkage to the higher trophic levels. So this is really us trying to understand, you know, really what is driving that ener the, the energetics of the food web. And then last slide. And the last piece that, piece that we've been working on, and we're just getting started on this, is that in Matagorda Bay, we have one of the, one, a very, another very unique habitat that is not found in many places in the world, and that are, that's these wind tidal flats. So tidal flats, you can kind of think of as a special type, or wind tidal flats are a special type of tidal flat in which their inundation by the water around them is really driven by the winds rather than by the tides. So they're really infrequently or unpredictably flooded, and they are um, subject to ex some environmental extremes, you know, temperature fluctuations from summer to winter, for example. So our goal for this study is to try to really <coughs> understand the spatial and temporal dynamics and differences of these wind tidal flat communities, which we know are incredibly important, for example, for foraging, um, for um, migrating birds, as well as threatened and endangered species. And so the way that we're trying to set this up right now is we're in the site selection stage. These are some maps that came out of the BioWest sampling. And so they have identified wind tidal flats that have algal mats on them. And these algal mats, um, really can cover extensive or almost all of the emerged um, part of the flat. Those areas are um, shown on here with the little light blue circles. And they also have identified wind tidal flats without algal mats, and those are the dark blue circles. So we can try to make some comparisons between or to try to understand differences between these flats that have extensive algal mat coverage versus um, less extensive coverage. Um, these algal mats, I should mention, these are not kind of macroalgae that you're normally thinking of. These are typically dominated by cyanobacteria, by filamentous cyanobacteria that makes sort of like a leathery or a felt sort of mat that you may have seen if you're out, ever out there. Um, these sites are over, also overlaid onto these polygons, those kind of lightish green polygons in the background, which designate the BioWest um, bird survey sites and logger stations, which are shown with that yellow shape. Um, and what we're going to be trying to do in this chapter is just to understand the in faunal community, which again is important, really critical prey for these birds, these migrating birds, to understand how the in fauna are connected to these algal mats and understand sort of as these algal mats and these wind tidal flats are threatened by things like coastal development, as well as um, slowly getting drowned out by um, rising sea level how we can understand their ecological role so that we can think about conservation and management decisions in the future. And that's it for me. So I am happy to pass it off to, it looks like, Dr. Wells. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Pollock. And up next is Dr. Wells to talk about things maybe a little higher up in the food web. <clears throat> All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is David Wells. I'm at the Galveston campus. Um, Greg, if you want to just, uh, Hit hit the uh, next button. To there's a couple of uh, text. Yeah. So it, thanks for uh, having me be able to explain a little bit about what we're doing. Um, very collaborative with what Dr. Pollock's doing in terms of kind of trying to understand the estuary and food webs. Uh, really, what's fueling them? What's driving the carbon source to these upper level consumers? Um, so obviously, there's a lot of different productive habitats with the base system. And so these food web studies are really uh, beneficial in order to identify specific primary producers that may uh, disproportionately contribute uh, carbon sources to these important species, whether it's you know the birds or the sea turtles or some of these sport fish. Um, so we're really trying to understand the functional roles of these different habitats uh, to these different species uh, throughout the bay system and how it's all connected. Okay, Greg. And so uh, 
we're all we're all working in the same uh, general system. Obviously, you've heard uh, from Dr. Pollock about the oyster reefs and the seagrass and the marsh. These primary producers, uh, well, not the oyster reefs, but the primary producers of the seagrass and the salt marsh. You can see the map um, of Matagorda Bay. And Greg, if you don't mind, uh, going to the there you go. Uh, this shows where we're sampling, so we're kind of taking a, a, a big uh, bay-wide picture, so we can really get the kind of both spatial and temporal components to the food web dynamics within this system, um, ranging from east and also uh, kind of north to south along that uh, low salinity to high salinity system. So we can really get a good picture of uh, what, the, what the food web looks like and what these uh, stable isotopes that Dr. Pollock was talking about, how they change uh, throughout the base system, because they are certainly gonna change um from species to species uh depending on where you get them okay uh, one more. there we go and so these are uh some of the main critters and techniques that we're, we're we're sampling so all of the green samples are your primary producers your source of organic matter that is really driving and fueling the system ranging from the water samples that you can isolate the POM or the particular organic matter, kind of your, um, your phytoplankton. Um, you've got your benthic microalgae and detritus, your kind of benthic source of uh, carbon, and then some of the different marsh plants like spartina, the seagrass, and some different macroalgae. And then by collecting all these different species, um, you're also trying to use uh, other techniques to get the upper consumers. So we're using bag sains and entanglement nets to catch some of the uh, uh, upper level consumers like the invertebrates, the shrimps and the crabs, and then uh, some of the um, bait fish, sport fish, some of the large predators, uh, the sharks and rays as well, so that we can kind of connect uh, all the pieces together, understand what's eating what, and really what's driving uh, the, the carbon production um, through this food web. Okay. You can go ahead and click uh, click it. Okay. Yeah. So the 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 first things that we is uh, to characterize this food web is identify uh, these primary um, producers. They're their chemical signatures within the bay. These are similar biplots uh, that uh, Dr. Pollock was showing up in green, and that's basically kind of showing you uh, a, a theoretical separation of these different chemical profiles. Uh, plotted in, in two axes of your primary producers. And then the goal you hope is that they separate out uh, from one another. And then you can um, use mixing models to be able to estimate what I say there in the first bullet, the primary contributions. You can estimate the percentage of organic matter going into the food web to your particular animal or animals, organisms of in interest ranging from um, you know, the, the turtles, the birds, the fish, the shrimp. Um, so it's a really powerful approach. And uh, you can also use nitrogen to estimate trophic level and get an idea of where they sit uh, in, the, in the food web in terms of um, you know, primary producer, primary consumer, all the way up. And then you can kind of try to start looking at isotopic niche overlap and um, if there's any, any prey interactions. And it's really important too to uh, be able to analyze, make, get these collections over the different seasons. So we're we're taking a quarter sampling approach, so we can uh, look at the seasonal shifts that occur throughout uh, both uh, space and time, um, and be able to document that over the two-year period that we're working here. Yep. Great. And hopefully, um, at the end of the day, we can identify uh, important habitats that are uh, maybe more or less uh, productive, um, certain carbon sources that are significantly more um, important in terms of fueling uh, the production in this system. All right, great. So, so far, what we've done um, is pretty good, given we're, we're in, the, in this situation all together as a team with COVID. But all of our core sampling has been completed. We started in March. We got all our, uh, all our sampling done in March, in June, and September. 
Um, in addition to the quarterly sampling, we've been supplementing uh, some opportunistic uh, samp sampling the other months just to go in and get some of those consumers, um, putting the nets in the water and um, getting getting more uh, and upper part of the trophic levels uh, in May, August, and October. So we've got over 250 different uh, organisms, individual fish and invertebrates that have been collected so far. Okay. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah. And the last slide basically is just kind of highlighting where we're at now. So all primary producers, all those seagrass, the, uh, all, uh, the benthic diatoms, uh, the detritus, the phytoplankton, it's all been processed uh, throughout all the quarterly surveys in terms of these primary producers. And so what we do now is we actually, uh, that we have them processed, we ship them to the UC Davis stable isotope lab, and we're hoping to do that uh, this week or next week um, so that we can get that, um, that, that first major uh, finding of how these primary producers within Matagorda system over this first year of the project look. And in terms of the consumers in the base system, um, we've identified everything we've collected, and we're about halfway with removing uh, the muscle tissue, which is the tissue that we actually analyze uh, for the stable isotope chemistry. Um, and we'll we'll get that get all those processed over the the coming weeks and months. And then we also have a lot of biops in, a, in these nets. We're uh, very lively animals that we certainly don't want to kill or harvest. Um, so we take a little biopsy. Uh, of uh, a tissue from them and then put them back in the water. And so we're cleaning those and getting them ready to process. So hopefully next uh, next round that we all will have uh, a lot of good detailed uh, results, but that's where we're at right now. All right, well, thanks, Dr. Wells. Uh, up next is Dr. Rooker to talk about some of the community analyses that uh, <clears throat> his team has been working on. Jay, are you ready? I'm ready, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, our, our component really centers on, on ecosystem services provided by Matagorda Bay with a with a special emphasis on the role, its role as a nursery habitat. So our, our aim is to identify habitats, regions, and environmental conditions in Matagorda Bay that define these nurseries. Selected metrics for assessing ecosystem health. First one is obviously abundance, um, and we're going to tack on survival to that of the juvenile fish assemblage that are inhabiting these nurseries. We're also quantifying the taxonomic diversity of the juvenile assemblage, and, and this is very similar to benefits of, of diversity in a stock portfolio. Species diversity or taxonomic diversity is going to enhance resilience and an ecosystem's ability to essentially adapt to changing conditions. So in ecology, we oftentimes refer to this as a portfolio effect. And finally, we are going to uh, assess the nutritional condition uh, of, of one model species uh, to look at nursery habitat quality and how that varies uh, over time and space. And one, I should mention one important, I, I put up there an ancillary benefit uh, is that we are establishing baselines uh, of abundance and taxonomic diversity that can be used for assessing future impacts to the ecosystem. Next slide, Greg. So we, we are conducting quarterly uh, sampling of, of demersal fauna. Uh, we initiated that in the fall of 2019. We've completed four quarterly uh, surveys to date, uh, and the future surveys are actually listed on there with the next one actually occurring in uh, December uh, of this year. And although most view the value of adults in many taxes is easily recognized, which the top two plots of the spotted sea trout and the red drum, but what happens during the early life often determines the year class strength of adults. Uh, and therefore, these early life assessments are, are really important determinants of ecosystem health. So we're conducting these with a with a benthic sled. Uh, and this is gear that 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 the Stuns and Rooker Labs have each probably pulled thousands of times in the last two decades, I would imagine. Uh, we're using this to collect and quantify both 
invertebrates, uh, and they're being passed along to Greg's lab and the fishes from our lab. And we're focusing on two primary nursery habitats, uh, seagrass and marsh edge habitats. Next one, Greg. So this gives you an idea. Our surveys are comprised of, of nine uh, sites. There are essentially three replicates per habitat type that are sampled during each quarterly survey. We have a combination of, of certain sites. Uh, seagrass is red only, so we have some sites that are seagrass only. We have some sites in gray that are uh, marsh edge only. And then we have some sites in the middle, which are a combination of seagrass and marsh, which really provide for, provide for paired sampling, which really allows us to evaluate uh, differences between the two habitats. We're also collecting environmental data uh, for habitat modeling. So obviously water temperature, salinity, um, the sites are positioned along this salinity gradient, um, depth, turbidity, substrate, uh, shoot density of seagrasses. We have other explanatory variables like distance to the tidal pass, distance to a freshwater source. And, and the goal of this is to determine which of these explanatory variables influence the abundance of biodiversity of both invertebrates and fishes inhabiting these, these nurseries. So basically this translates into identifying the drivers of high quality nursery habitat in Matagorda Bay. Last slide, Greg. So in addition to, to nursery habitat quality, which we are evaluating using essentially measures of abundance, which is a which is a essentially a proxy for potential production from that nursery ground uh, and diversity uh, of both invertebrate and fish assemblages. We are also looking at the nutritional condition, which is a, essentially a measure of fitness, and we're doing this for a model species spotted sea trout using a biochemical measure, which is referred to as an RNA DNA ratio, which will allow us to assess the habitat quality of different nurseries in the Matagorda Bay complex. So the way this is a bit more complicated because to accomplish this, we, we first need to rear juvenile spotted sea trout under variable conditions. We're essentially trying to rear them under conditions that are from well-fed to very food limited to essentially establish a baseline for what low and high quality foraging conditions look like in terms of an RNA DNA ratio. So fortunately, we can do this uh, with individuals that are produced from, from TPWD hatcheries. We will then determine the, the condition of wild caught spotted sea trout. And these are post settlers in the seagrass and marsh edge and our nine sampling stations uh, from again, the different nurseries and regions to identify high quality habitats in Matagorda Bay. So essentially this means high RNA DNA ratios uh, translate into high condition, and this translates <laughs> into individuals from that nursery habitat have a higher potential of survival and recruitment success. So we're hoping to complete, uh, my graduate student Liam, we're hoping to start uh, some of these trials um, in the next few months once they start producing uh, spotted sea trout again. And we've already been collecting all of the spotted sea trout from our sampling and putting them in minus 80 that we can use for the RNA DNA analysis. And with that, I'm done, Greg, and I'll pass it along. Okay. okay. Thank you, Jay. And up next to talk about some of the water quality parameters is uh, Dr. Mike Wetz. Are you ready, Mike? I'm ready, Greg. Thanks. Go ahead. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Mike Wetz. I'm the HRI Chair for Coastal Ecosystem Processes. Uh, my lab's focus, like Greg said, is on water quality assessment in Matagorda Bay. Um, water quality is obviously not as charismatic as, as the fish and turtles, so I'm, I'm a little worried what our um, story map's going to look like. I guess we'll have <laughs> bottles of water of different colors or something, but we'll have to figure that one out. Um, but nonetheless, water quality is still a really critical component of the ecosystem because it's a sensitive indicator of environmental change. And it's also really a critical determinant of habitat quality. So basically without good water quality, you can't have a healthy fishery. 
So what our work is doing is going to tell what the water quality conditions have been in the recent past. So over the, the past 20 to 30 years, uh, what those conditions are now and also what they may look like in the near future based on um, current trends that we're seeing. So my group is really taking two different approaches to assess water quality conditions in the Bay. Um, the first one that you see here with this slide is a very broad scale assessment of conditions. Uh, so what we're doing is using historical and ongoing um, data collected by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So they have fixed stations at all of those stars throughout the Bay where they collect data on a quarterly basis. And so what we're, we're going to be doing is analyzing that historical data, which goes back about 30 years in most cases, to look at how the water quality conditions have changed over time. Next slide, Greg. And, and basically what, you, what we're going to end up with is, is a map that looks similar to this. This is from some work that we just completed looking at the same data set um, using data up through 2015 and for the whole Texas coast but it'll be zoomed in on the Matagorda Bay ecosystem. So this analysis will give us a snapshot of what, what the average conditions look like in the Bay, but also how they've changed over time for different water quality variables. Um, so in this example, you can see there in the black box, we've noted a long-term increase in the salinity in parts of Matagorda Bay. So the analysis that we're gonna be doing now will use more recent data collected up through 2020. Uh, next slide, Greg. So the second um, approach that we're using to, to characterize the water quality conditions is a monthly boat based water quality sampling program where we go out and collect um, data from for a variety of water quality variables at 11 stations in the bay. And so what we've been able to do is really establish this nice sampling gradient that captures the, the salinity gradient, so from the fresher water uh, moving out towards the ocean inlet, and then also a productivity gradient. So from higher productivity, higher nutrient waters near the delta out towards the lower productivity ocean water. And this, this ongoing sampling program is really meant as a way to support the food web studies and some of the other habitat characterization work by really providing a, a more modern snapshot of what the water quality conditions are and um, how they're changing in relation to weather patterns and, and rain events and things like that. Uh, next, Greg. So that, that, um, that sampling covers a lot of ground. Um, we certainly couldn't do it on our own. We've been very fortunate to have um, Ed O'Borney's group who takes us out on, on the, so the west side of Matagorda Bay but at the same time, we have a couple of really dedicated volunteers, um, Mr. Gann and Mr. Romine, who take us out every month on their boats so that we can cover simultaneously the, the eastern side of Matagorda Bay. So we've been very fortunate to have these really engaged citizens who've helped us to expand the, the coverage that we can do with the um, water quality sampling. So I, I'm not sure if they're on, but if they are, I'd just like to, to really thank them and, and acknowledge how important their contribution has been. Uh, next, Greg. So before I close, I just wanted to talk about one of the longer term challenges that we're seeing that, that's facing the Matagorda Bay ecosystem. And specifically, that's this issue of, of harmful algal blooms. So since um, since about 2008, the commercial shellfish harvesting has been shut down. I think it's been seven times because of the presence of, um, of harmful algal blooms in the water. And so um, we've also had a number of fish kills in, in Matagorda Bay that have been due to either harmful algal blooms or hypoxia. So we, we, we happened to capture one of these events back in January and February of this year where we, we detected this, this algae species called Dinophysis that turned out to be part of a more broader coast-wide event. So what we were able to do is inform um, Parks and Wildlife and the State Health Services. And um, they ended up, because of the high numbers of this organism, they had to shut down the, the shellfish beds in the system. 
So one of the, the real challenges, though, with the harmful algal blooms, again, because we've been seeing these becoming more pervasive in Matagorda Bay, unfortunately, we don't, aside from the sampling we're doing, we don't have a good sustained monitoring for these, these HAB species. So it's really difficult to mitigate their impacts, whereas if we had more sampling and more early warning, we could potentially do that and be more proactive. The other challenge is that this lack of sampling really um, it limits our understanding of what causes these things. And so, you know, we're kind of left with really not knowing are these sort of natural phenomenon or is there something changing in the bay that's that's causing these things. Um, so, you know, one of my real goals for 2021 is to not only get additional samples to better characterize these events, but also to link our field data with the trend analysis that we're going to be doing for the water quality to see if there are things that are changing in the bay that might be contributing to these things. And then also to, to lay the groundwork for um, more targeted future harmful algal bloom monitoring efforts in the system. I really feel strongly that, that this is an ongoing and pressing need for Matagorda Bay and for the health of the ecosystem. So that's what we're, we're going to be focusing on um, this coming year. And that's it, Greg. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, and last but not least, I mean, obviously, this ecosystem assessment <clears throat> is being done to characterize what's needed to support species like birds, but especially sea turtles and uh, those endangered species. And so Dr. Pam Plotkin's group leads that. And Dr. Natalie Wilderman today is going to be presenting uh, where they are so far with um, the sea turtle tracking and the tracking networks that they have set up. So, Natalie, if you're ready, go ahead. Uh, Natalie, I think you're muted. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay, there you go. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, well, thank you very much, Greg, and good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to quickly go over our part uh, of the project is to understand how sea turtles are moving and using the habitats uh, and resources in Matagorda Bay. And if you'd like to know more details, please check out the story map uh, and the web page. Um, you'll find okay. everything there. Next slide, please. Uh, no, actually, uh, let's oh. keep this one. Yes. Um, yeah, so... In order to achieve this, we have been setting entanglement nets in the water to capture turtles. Uh, the green diamonds in the map uh, on the left is where we have captured sea turtles. Uh, we have captured nine turtles in total uh, so far, and two of them have received acoustic transmitters, and four of them have received satellite transmitters. And this is so we can track their movements in the bay. Uh, we have more tags that we will be deploying in the next few months. Uh, it does take time to gather enough robust data from the tracking devices, so I will show you some of the preliminary results that, uh, of the movements of the tag turtles we have. Next slide, please. So here's a quick look at the Matagorda acoustic network, um, which is an array of listening receivers. Uh, you can see the triangles, the light triangles. And these receivers detect animals with acoustic transmitters, like the one you can see in the picture. And this includes fishes, sharks, and of course, our turtles. And this array is being used by multiple research teams, including Dr. Stunz, Dr. Wilson, ours. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so both uh, the turtles that have received acoustic transmitters so far were captured in the southwestern portion of the bay, um, you can see the in the two maps on the bottom, it's the movements of these turtles. The triangles represent the acoustic listening receivers, like the ones we just saw in the other map, uh, and the circles indicate how often the turtles uh, were detected by the receivers. We're very still uh, early on on the project, but we can already start to see some very interesting movements and differences between the turtles. Uh, for example, the one on the left, uh, she spent more time uh, near to the shore be between the Saluria Bayou and the Mule Stuff entrance, uh, while the turtle on the right was detected more often closer to Pesca Value, although she also visited the, the near shore uh, receivers. Next slide, please. 
So now for our satellite uh, tech turtles, uh, in this map you can see the green line following the movement of grades. Uh, each point uh, is a GPS location we received from the satellite uh, transmitter and the line uh, connects these points. So GRACE was released near Pasca Valley in November last year in 2019. And within a month, uh, she started to move uh, during the winter into Port Aransas. And even though GRACE didn't stay in Matagorda Bay, uh, it is a perfect example of how protecting um, the resources in Matagorda Bay will have an impact at a much broader scale that goes beyond the bay because they're all connected. Next slide, slide please. So in contrast, we have the second turtle, Anna, uh, who we tagged this year, and she uh, we tagged her near Deck Rose Point, and she has stayed in a very small area um, since we tagged her. She is still transmitting, and we're very excited to see what she decides to do over the winter and into the summer. Um, maybe she'll stay there, maybe she'll move somewhere else in the bay. Um, what resources is, is, is she going to prefer? Um, there's a lot of questions, and one of the many great things about this project is that we will be able to shed some light on these questions by integrating the movements of the turtles with the habitat sampling and mapping that the other research teams are doing. Next slide, please. Another very exciting achievement this year is that we created a launch a citizen science app called Icy Turtle, and the idea of this app is that anyone who goes out in the bay and sees a turtle can go into the app and report the sighting and it will automatically show up in this map um, and you can it's publicly available uh, at the website on the bottom of the slide and then we can use this information to identify sites where we can set our nets and and have a better chance to finding our turtles um, we really hope that everyone will download the app use it share it widely please and uh, really generating this map uh, with this amount of effort is something that we wouldn't be able to achieve otherwise. Um, and if you already have used it, thank you so, so much. Um, next slide, please. So for the next few months, we have multiple field trips planned until we reach our transmitter quota. Um, we will be choosing uh, new netting locations based on the reports on IC Turtle and also where other teams are sampling. Um, very, very soon, we'll, the tracks of the satellite tech turtles will be publicly available. Um, so keep an eye on our Twitter and social media for the announcements on that. And ultimately, we're waiting to hear back on the results from the other researchers. It was great to see some of those results already during this talk, um, because we really want to integrate them with our results. And this is why each of the parts of the project are going to be so important to understand. And with that, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions in the next section. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Natalie. And that really con concludes our presentations of sort of where we are and where we're headed with the scientific team. I, I put this slide back up here just to talk about, you know, how important it is to have this kind of information, and that's exactly what's needed to really carry out ecosystem-based management when you have a project that really takes these types of approaches from really getting down to the basics of the food web all the way up to larger, more charismatic um, species like sharks and birds and that sort of thing. And all of these projects work together um, to feed into that from basic mapping to understanding where these areas occur all the way up to large scale movements of sea turtles. And so towards the end of the year, of course, into 2020, we'll be wrapping all this up and, and really begin to uh, understand and and put together a larger picture of what's really going on in terms of Matagorda Bay and how that ecosystem functions to support endangered species. So this presentation, if you're interested, will be online um, where all of our other information is. And I went ahead and put up here, I'm not gonna talk through this today, but in terms of what are our major milestones and what do we have to do to get to the end point of a better understanding of Matagorda Bay, but I wanted to have that up there so if people read that in the future, they can understand it. Of course, that's captured in our story map in a lot of other places. And so at this point, I think we have uh, plenty of time for questions. And Natalie, uh, um, Chelsea, I'll put this uh, slide up here if you wanted to remind folks about, you know, if they have a question of how they need to do that. And um, I'll go ahead and, and end the presentation phase of this here in just a second. And our team's here to, to answer any questions that, that folks may have.
Excellent. Well, thank you, Greg. Thank you, everyone, for covering so much information in, in such a small amount of time. Um, we we appreciate it. Really impressive. <laughs> um, moving into the Q&A session, you know, we appreciate folks holding their questions for the end here. Again, we would like to use the chat box as much as possible. So you can access this chat box using the little sort of speech bubble in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Go ahead and type your question to everyone and then hit enter once you've you know sort of got your question where you like it and we'll all be able to see it. Lauren Borland is moderating our chat today so she can kind of read off our questions and I think you know a lot of this will be directed towards the PIs so just PIs yeah, feel free to jump in. Now, if you have a really complex question or, or you'd like to kind of back it up with more context, um, we can unmute you. Just indicate to Lauren in the chat that you would like to speak. Um, otherwise, you know, folks, this meeting is recorded. I know, I know it's just about dinner time, so feel free to jump off um, and you can catch the presentation and the Q&A session later when we share links and, and meeting recordings in a follow-up email. Um, but with that, Lauren, I think I'll hand it over to you. Okay, and Chelsea, I'll stop sharing the screen and I'll maybe I'll just sort of leave this, this one up here for now to give a perspective um, of the project. And then um, that way maybe everyone, well, maybe everyone can see each other if I, stop sharing might be more conducive to q a and i just wanted to say chelsea our team is available <clears throat> we're easily reached from our contact pages on i mean contacts on all the pages that we've been discussing and we're more than happy to talk with the general public about what's going on and what's happening or answer other questions if folks don't get get their questions um available tonight so i just wanted to make sure that they know we're we're happy to continue the discussion All right, well, our first question, uh, I believe, is for Dr. Rooker. Um, the question is, why was spotted sea trout chosen? Uh, does this tell a good story about high quality habitats more broadly? And can the conclusions about that species be extrapolated to other species? Yeah, that's a really good question. What, one limitation that we have when we're using these biochemical measures is we have to perform lab trials to establish a baseline and a relationship between what's a good condition, what's a modest condition, and what's a poor condition. So we're somewhat limited in terms of using something that's being produced in a hatchery. Um, so we're kind of limited to, to red drum, spotted sea trout, potentially flounder, um, since we're working in seagrass beds, we're going to do a lot of work in the summer when we typically find spotted sea trout um, settling into these nursery grounds and marsh edge habitats. We thought that would be a good model species. There's been some work done actually by me a while ago using red drum in a similar fashion. Um, but the hope is with these model species that you can extrapolate out. Um, but again, in a perfect world, it would be nice to do two or three species, but it's a full experimental trial, and that's the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this question is for Dr. Jim Jabot. Uh, for the historical land cover depictions, can you explain more of what we're seeing in the 1943 to 1972 depiction? Uh, is it more a reflection of 1943 or 1972 or something in between? Um, well, I don't really have a great answer for that. That's a long time period between those, those two dates and we're looking for um, more data in between. Um, I, I think the, uh, the Tiger Island uh, Delta was, was growing though and had uh, that Parker Channel had been opened up um, it's either during during that time period um, I can't think of exactly when it w would have been opened up and that's the uh, tiger tiger um, island a uh, little delta down there on the lower left hand part of the of the um, delta itself and uh, 
But other than that, I really can't um, give you much of a better uh, answer right at this time. But stay tuned. Um, and there may be uh, someone out there that actually knows. Thank you. Well, Greg, while we're sort of buying time for folks to type in, oh, never mind. I don't need to. But if if there's an awkward pause, please um, please feel free to sort of ad lib and and tie some more ideas like this together. Yeah, sure. All right. So this question is for Dr. Pollock. Uh, do you think that there will be some information that will help with the understanding of the development of wind driven Tidal plots for projects trying to recreate that ecosystem. Um, thanks for your question. That's a very good question. I don't know that our research will directly be able to help understand the development of the wind tidal flats. But what I do hope that we can get information about or start to understand um, in a more comprehensive way. It's just the ecology of these wind tidal flats in general. There's such unique systems and there's so little that's been studied about them, particularly in our area. I mean, our understanding certainly is lagging behind our, our interest in these systems. And because like I was um, alluding to before, we know that these areas get targeted more for coastal development, for things like marsh mitigation projects and reclamation. Um, because they're sort of viewed as these barren areas um, that getting a better understanding of their ecological importance, their ecological role will really help at least the conservation, restoration, management, decision making framework by just providing a better scientific understanding. I hope that I hope that answers your question. Well, and also to add to that, Ginny, I'm going to put Ed O'Borney on the spot real quick here, Ed, if you're if you're there already. You know, we we had a lot of ground to cover today in a short period of time with all the investigators, but Ed's been doing a lot of work on those wind tidal flats with birds as well, Ginny, and, and things that he didn't have time to talk about today, such as a lot of listening and observation and that sort of thing. And so, Ed, I don't know if you want to chime in just for a minute or two here and talk about, you know, that related to that question, but just in general, uh, some of the bird pieces that we didn't really have time to get into, because I'm sure there's a lot of folks here that, that have a high interest um, in the work you're doing with those. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Uh, I, I think Jenny covered the question pretty well with respect to, can we get all the way to restoration? Uh, maybe. Uh, the real question is just the ecology. What's driving these wind tidal flats? Because clearly from a bird standpoint, they're being highly utilized. Uh, shorebirds, plovers, uh, are, we, we see them out there at, at the right time of the year. We'll have, have more coming back here for our winter surveys. But highly being utilized. And to get to the point where you can start doing restoration or recreation of some of these types of habitat, understand the ecology. So we're kind of... That, that's where we're at. I think it's going to be a very valuable component of this project. And I'll just add one more thing, which is that the information hopefully can help inform restoration in terms of understanding what a functioning wind tidal flat should look like. So maybe some success metrics for um, gauging restoration success in the future. Yeah, great point. I mean, the other thing is sea level rise. I mean, these areas are, are you know, plus or minus six inches or can, can make a big difference in these areas. Uh, and so that's another key aspect. This next question is for Dr. Pollock again. Uh, can you follow up on the harvested versus unharvested reefs observations? Are you saying that uh, species abundance is similar or species composition or both? Hey, Shane, thanks for your question. Um, no, I'm not speaking at all really about species composition or anything um, from a community perspective in that um, figure that I showed. We were just looking at the stable isotope composition of the different components that we had collected. So 
another part of the study is looking at what what species are inhabiting both the harvested and, in, and unharvested reefs, what the composition, relative composition or proportion of those organisms are between the different systems, their biomass, et cetera. And I don't have, I didn't present anything on that today. We're still working through those samples. That actually is taking us a lot longer, but um, hopefully next time we do this or you know, very soon, we'll have some early observations, but follow up with me on the side if you want, Shane, and I can, I can dig in and see what we have. Thank you. Uh, so for Dr. Wetz, um, on monitoring for harmful algal blooms, are there ongoing monitoring programs in other states? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are generally, these are researcher led though, so they're kind of at the whims of funding cycles and, and they're often very location specific. Uh, so in general, in the US, we don't do a great job of monitoring for HABs. And so that's why we end up in situations like Florida in 2018, when they had huge red tide blooms coupled with a huge brown tide bloom, coupled with huge green tide bloom, and it had major economic impacts on, on the state overall. So um, one of the things that we've done locally is I just actually <laughs> completed a um, the development of a harmful algal bloom monitoring plan for the, the Texas Coastal Bend region um, that was informed by ongoing efforts and, and you know, stakeholder input and, and existing data. So, you know, that's one of the things we're going to be working on over the next few years is trying to implement that so that Texas can get ahead of the curve because we know these issues are there and they're going to most likely in a lot of places continue to get worse. Um, just Real quickly, in Texas, we do have three um, monitoring uh, sensors that, that detect HABs in real time, but they're unfortunately not located anywhere near Matagorda Bay and San Antonio Bay. There's one up around Galveston, um, one at Port Aransas, and one down in the valley. So we have this big gap from Matagorda Bay and San Antonio Bay that really needs to be filled in terms of harmful algal bloom monitoring because it really leaves us vulnerable right now. Uh, I believe this question is for Natalie. Um, is there a minimum number of sea turtles you're hoping to track in order to get a good sample? Um, and what could realistically be understood if nine individuals are tracked? Yeah. Can you hear me this time? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's a really good question. Thank you. And well, obviously, the more turtles we track, uh, the better, and that's the case with any animal tracking study. Um, we believe that we have uh, nine turtles uh, with satellite tracking and also some more. We're going to have about 15 turtles, both with acoustic and satellite transmitters. And we're confident that by combining the, the data from these two sets, uh, we're going to get a good understanding of how the turtles are using the bay. Um, each turtle has their own individual behavior, so we might, uh, you know, track a hundred turtles and still see differences. Uh, but many tracking studies uh, use way less uh, tracks than this one. Um, so we do believe uh, we're going to have a good sample to understand the movements of these turtles in this ecosystem. Thank you, Natalie. Well, Natalie, I guess I'll pose a question while we're giving folks time to think of more thoughts on, you know, can you share a little bit what it's like to try to pull a sea turtle out of the water and into the boat? Yeah, of course. So um, our adventure starts when we put uh, in the nets. Uh, we have to monitor the buoys uh, every very, very often. Um, so when we see, we can either see like uh, one of the buoys is starting to sink or move to one of the sides, or we see a big splash. That's usually the first sign that we've caught a turtle. So we approach the net. Um, the turtles that we've caught, they're about 40 centimeters. So they're 
this big. Um, they're easy to handle and not too heavy to bring into the boat. Um, and it's usually we are all very uh, well trained. We've been working with turtles for many years, so um, we take the net out of the around the turtle and then we bring her or him <laughs> uh, to the shore um, and work with it uh, under the shade uh, on the shore while the rest of the team is uh, keeps looking for turtles in the net. Chelsea, while there, there's a, oh, go ahead. I want to, I was going to change directions here. If there was another follow up or something for the sea turtle. Oh, go ahead. Uh, it reminded me with what Natalie's working on the IC turtle app that they have, as well as Mike Wetz's work with the water quality. And we briefly just touched on it um, in early parts of the presentation about the opportunities for others to get engaged in maybe a, a different way than just, you know, reading or learning about the project, but really becoming involved from a citizen science standpoint. And so we encourage anyone um, that's interested in that to reach out to the, the investigators about what opportunities there might be to do that. I mean, it's as easy as, you know, entering sea turtle observations on the app, or you can become more involved like Dr. Wetz's where you're actually in a boat collecting samples that are being utilized. And so there's a broad um, range of opportunities and we welcome that. And I didn't have enough time during our presentation to really talk about how important that is, but Natalie keyed in on me in the sense that when we involve citizen science, we can really leverage the science here and do things that we never could do normally because you, you couldn't mount that amount of effort and the cost would be too great and that sort of thing. And so this represents a good opportunity for that sort of involvement. So we're, we'd be happy to facilitate that for folks that are interested. And then Greg, to reiterate, what's the best way for folks interested in helping to get in touch? Uh, email is probably the best way to, to reach us and all of our emails are easily accessible through the project page. Excellent. And we can share a link to the project page in, in any of our follow-up communication. Yeah. All right. This next question is for uh, Natalie and Dr. West. Um, can the harmful algal bloom and turtle tracking data be used to help understand the short or long-term effects of these HABs on turtles? Do you want me to take that, Natalie? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, that's another great question. Um, I'm not sure that our sampling program is adequate to address that. Um, it would be easier to do with less mobile organisms. Um, I, I will take a step back and say that when we had the, I think it was the 2008 bloom of dinophysis, um, which is a toxic algae, there were coincidentally um, some unexplained die-offs of dolphins uh, in up around that region. And I think there was some linkage to, to the, the bloom itself. Um, one of the challenges is that we're not actually measuring algal toxins at the moment. Um, so we would need a more concerted um, effort and, you know, we would have to do, we would have to, we would have to sample more frequently and in more locations in the Bay, I think, to really make that linkage. It can be done, but I don't know that, that, the, that this sampling design will address that question, but it is a really important um, longer term goal, I think, with, with um, any type, type of effort to expand, um, you know, harmful algae monitoring efforts is something we should be trying to do is make those linkages with the living resources. And Chelsea, I, I would add to that just as, as an example, I know that, that that one is a little bit different, difficult given the monitoring of the harmful algal blooms and spatially and temporally. But in general, the whole idea of the project from an ecosystem based approach like this is to be able to make predictive questions like that or, or, or provide answers to, to questions like that and other similar ones where, you know, most of the time. And I, I think several of us touched on it and, and you did too, Chelsea, in the very beginning where you're really focused on a single species and the very fine nuanced um, behaviors, for example, of, of certain species or something. 
where the, the, the approach here is very different, where we're looking at what, what are the real ecosystem needs of a healthy estuary to su support endangered species. Of course, we got the tracking and the satellite tracking, the acoustic array to look at more fine scale movement patterns on top of that. But in general, and it may not be as impaired today because we covered a lot of information, there's a lot of moving parts, but at the end of this project, when it all ties together, we'll be able to really look at the ecosystem as a whole. And so that's the whole sort of uh, uh, standard of this ecosystem-based management. So this question uh, is for everyone. Were there any findings that have surprised you during the study so far? I'm, I'm sure we've all and... got some. <laughs> I'll say one just to leave, I'll break the ice. We had, I think, and I speak for several people, we had no idea how big Matagorda Bay really is until you start to get out there and start sampling. I mean, we all look at a map, we've all been there, and then, you know, Ed's having to run transects from one end to the other. It, you, you, it's hard to appreciate the size of, of that bay until you're really out there and having to cover it on a, in a short period of time. Uh, additionally, as a follow-up, uh, have you discovered that there are any big gaps in the study that will limit the ability to answer some of the study goals? Well, I'll wait for my team maybe to jump in. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in on the other one. It, maybe there is there any other surprises or interesting things that you're you're finding, Natalie, perhaps with the sea turtles or other things that, that, that y'all are seeing? Yeah, I was going to jump in on that one. Um, yeah, so there's two things actually that uh, we're, one we're really puzzled by, the other one we're really excited about. So we still don't uh, trying to figure out why some turtles are staying uh, and some others are not uh, during winter. Um, so far, most of the turtles are staying. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see if we can, you know, um, figure out what's going on uh, in that sense. And another thing is we're like, we have been so excited to see how many people have been using the app and we really discovered new places uh, and went to those places. And we actually caught one, uh, the turtle that we satellite tag, we caught it based on one of the locations that um, were reported on the, on the app. So that's been very, very exciting to see the level of engagement and uh, that people have um, with this part of uh, the project. Well, to, to answer the, the follow-up piece to that about gaps and that sort of thing, certainly in science, you know, where it's a constant building process with a knowledge base. So, you know, any good study always opens up a bunch of new questions that that you discover and you know you have hindsight at that point obviously to to look back and and, and see maybe how you either do things different or, or what questions did come up that went along to to remind everyone you know we're we're just in midstream in this project you know we're this isn't the end we got a lot more work to do and that sort of thing so i'm sure we'll uncover gaps and that sort of thing and i envision what we'll do chelsea is we'll, we'll have obviously a very nice final report that'll capture all this and tie things together and put it in the big picture, but in, in the realm of sort of adaptive management, which I think is where this question is going, is that we we would prepare a, a, a nice ending section about here's here's what we learned, but here's some things we do need to learn and future studies should focus on X, Y, and Z and that sort of thing. So right now, while that's a great question, you know, we've still got a lot of work to do to really pin down on, on what those gaps might look like at the end of the study. And Greg, when it comes to kind of sharing next steps, will that information kind of be tied into the final report so the public can can put those questions in context? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully that will set the stage for future projects and other investigators and other folks to carry on.
All right. Well, I think we we agreed out the gate to try to keep everyone until eight. Um, we're about 15 minutes early, I guess. This is a good time. Maybe invite all the presenters to make some closing comments. Um, again, totally up to you. Um, but it sounds like we'll be kind of getting together with everybody again this time next year, um, sharing sort of what we've continued to learn. And then in the meantime, there should be a lot of communication, you know, to the public, to all these groups involved on, you know, bits of information available along the way. But closing comments. Well, we have a pretty quiet bunch. Maybe this is this is unusual if you're in person. You know, we we you can't shut up a bunch of professors. You know, but I'll I'll jump in and say that you know one we're we're very appreciative of the state and the comptroller for funding a, a project of this magnitude. This is really unprecedented, and you really look around and we give a lot of lip service to ecosystem based management. This is really one of the first projects that. It really does it and ties it together nice with a very charismatic endangered species and birds and that sort of thing. So, as I mentioned, we're really right in the middle of this, but I would encourage everyone to stay tuned to the, the web pages and the, the story maps and to follow what's going on. If you haven't clicked through those story maps, they're very, very interactive. They're, they're, they're very much more detailed than what we could get into here today. And so I would encourage everyone to do that and stay tuned and. We'll really be looking forward in a year from now when we have much more data and, and, and we've assembled, you know, the, the, the story of, of what's happening in Matagorda Bay much more than we can now because we'll have collected a lot more data and that sort of thing to um, stay tuned for that. And we're really looking forward to it. Well, uh, would be that uh, it's, it's such a cool system. I mean, from the first trawls that I pulled back in the early 90s to to the trawls and stuff we're pulling today, it's it's dynamic, uh, it's ever changing, but yet there's some constants out there with respect to reefs and seagrass placements and and wind patterns and, and turbidity and so forth. And so it's uh, it's, it's a dynamic system. Uh, I think that a real key to this study is the time that's being allotted to actually look at a period uh, over several years. I think that's going to be really important uh, as we move forward. Uh, and then I think most importantly, I've appreciated the feedback that I've gotten from several of you on the call. I can see your names out there uh, and would encourage you to continue to provide feedback uh, to the team, any member of the team when you have comments or thoughts. A lot of you guys on the phone uh, know a lot about this base system as well. So we encourage as much feedback uh, questions, comments, as you guys uh, want to throw our way. We appreciate it. And, and I think that's a great point, Ed and Chelsea, just to jump in. I know we're running late here, but from our last stakeholder meeting, we got a lot of really great input and we really worked hard and we're able to incorporate a lot of that into the study design. There were certain things, you know, that we didn't think of that the public and others were, were interested in and they made sense and we were able to build that in um, where we could. So, you know, we're, you know, that we're happy to, Happy to do that where we can. All right. Well, with that, thank you again for everyone's time. Thank you for these these presentations. Excellent information. Um, and thanks to everyone who's tuned in. But I think with that, we will call it a night. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.